This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Turkmenistan President Sadar Bodi Mohamedov is currently in Beijing on a two-day state visit to China at the invitation of Chinese President Xi Jinping. His trip coincides with the 31st year anniversary of the establishment of ties between the two countries. How have bilateral ties grown between the two sides over the past three decades? And what does cooperation between the two countries mean as the Central Asian region is becoming increasingly important? To take a closer look, I'm glad to be joined today by Wang Jian, Associate Professor at Northwest University of China. Pavel Falkenhauer, Russian defense analyst. Juma Otbayev, former prime minister of the Kyrgyz Republic. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingduo. Welcome to the discussion, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Otbayev, uh, why don't you uh, give us some brief introduction about Turkmenistan, which is not in the news that often. And uh, we know it's in Central Asia. It's you know, relatively, uh, in terms of size, it's a small nation, small population, but very important. Uh, let me say that uh, the visit of uh, President of Turkmenistan to China is important not only for bilateral relationships between two countries, but between relationship between China and Central Asia as a whole. For very simple reason, because we are in Central Asia increasingly implementing coordinating policies. As everybody knows, uh, the first post-COVID trip abroad, President Xi Jinping made to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Yeah. So, and then he confirmed priority of coordination between China and Central Asia. So after that meeting, we have summit of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which again confirmed that Central Asia becoming more integrated region. So I would say that this is first visit after COVID, after first visit of President Xi Jinping abroad, it's very important because it's touched not only Turkmenistan, but Central Asia as a whole. This is what I mean by in my book, which will be published next month in Britain, about Central Asia coordination and importance of Central Asia as coordinated body of five unified countries. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more about uh, Central Asia as well as their relationship with uh, uh, big countries, including China, uh, in particular here, of course, in the case of uh, the visit here to China. Uh, Wang Jing, you know, if you look at uh, uh, Turkmenistan, for example, uh, despite what some would call uh, its isolationist policy, the country established a, a visa application center in China, I think back in 2018. And also, uh, you know, the two presidents met each other in September, uh, not a long ago. And now they are uh, on an official visit here in China. Uh, from uh, Turkmenistan in Beijing, two-day visit. So they are meeting again. Uh, that says a lot, probably, quite a bit about the importance of bilateral relationship, at least to these two countries. Yes, it means a lot to the, to the bilateral ties between China and Turkmenistan, uh, because for, on the one hand, politically, the two countries share a lot of uh, uh, the, the, the common ideas over what is happening uh, in this international politics. I think uh, the very, so that the very first topic will concentrate what is happening right now, especially some big events in the international politics. Uh, not only in the Euro Asia, but also the global level. So the two leaders will discuss and will share their opinions and try to find the common ground. And meanwhile, if we look at the, from the bilateral level, I think also a lot of uh, some other uh, 
topics will be on the top of the agendas. For example, the political bilateral ties, how to uh, encourage the, the further development of the bilateral ties, and how to uh, facilitate the, the new framework of the bilateral uh, cooperation and the bilateral relations to upgrade it into the new level. I think this will be also on the, on the topic of, the, of gender. And meanwhile, the bilateral economic relations will also become a very, very important topic in this uh, during this visit because China and the Turkmenistan, we are interested to, uh, to upgrade our economic ties into the new level, not only concentrated on the traditionally the en energy sector, but also expanded into the other sectors such as infrastructure, such as financial sectors, and even the, the, the people to people exchange sector will also be on the topic. So I think this visit is historic. It is very important. It will become the very new beginning uh, chapter for China's ties with Turkmenistan in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, Pavel, sitting uh, in Moscow, you know, when you look at uh, Turkmenistan in Central Asia, I mean, how important is this country to uh, this region as well as to say Moscow and Beijing? So Turkmenistan has, uh, since its re-establishment as a full independent state uh, in uh, 91, has been uh, uh, traditionally and absolutely neutral, unlike other uh, Central Asian uh, states, which have some uh, uh, alliance agreements with Moscow, Turkmenistan is a neutral nation, and now its neutrality is actually very much seriously challenged by what is happening in between Russia and the West, uh, not uh, simply by just uh, the virtue of uh, uh, logistical problems that have been, of course, uh, shared not only by Turkmenistan, but other uh, Central Asian nations that the sanctions regime, the uh, conflict in Ukraine have been increasingly uh, cutting and uh, impeding uh, all traditional logistical lines which were built from Central Asia through Russia to the West for 150 years since Russia was present in Central Asia. And now this is all being challenged. There's simply problems there. And that's why China and that's uh, not only export of, say, natural gas, but trade with China, connections through China. And of course, the Chinese project of uh, one way and one belt is increasingly important because this allows Central Asia to have actually not only be neutral, say, like uh, Turkmenistan, but have alternative uh, logistical corridors uh, that will allow them to continue to survive, uh, survive and prosper in a situation of a, a conflict between Russia and the West. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Otobayev, uh, if you take a look at uh, this, uh, let's continue the relationship between the two countries. For example, in 2014, they have uh, this uh, uh, strategic partnership. And uh, today, Beijing time, on uh, Friday, uh, the two leaders announced their relationship or elevation of their relationship to comprehensive strategic partnership. Uh, so comprehensive is added. Does that mean so their cooperation will say, be expanded from uh, you know, focusing on energy, uh, especially gas, to other sectors like uh, what Wang Jing has mentioned earlier? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, what is happening is that the cooperation now is not really comprehensive. So 80% of Turkmenistan's export abroad is export of Turkmenistan gas to China. It is not balanced, clearly. So we need a more approach when Turkmenistan also will be bringing Chinese goods into the country, as well as diversifying the export. Turkmenistan is a very rich country in terms of natural resources. Now they produce a lot of textile, a lot of energy. They can supply China with more of different products. It's absolutely clear. Uh, and then, uh, of course, everybody now these days concentrating around the export of gas. Turkmenistan is the biggest gas supply in the world to China. And China importing about 
170 billion cubic meters of gas only to meet their needs. Turkmenistan is the biggest supplier. Australia number two, United States number three. The difference between export of gas between US and Australia and uh, Turkmenistan is that the supply moving not through the sea. So sea supply of gas became vulnerable because of the chance of commercial or diplomatic embargoes, sanctions, or even military blockades. This is not good. So what is important that China will get more import of natural gas from the friendly country by land through the gas pipelines. And here in Turkmenistan, we don't have alternatives. Turkmenistan currently supplying almost 50 billion cubic meters of natural gas in comparison with Russia, which is something like 10 billion cubic meters. So it's dominating. But Turkmenistan can increase supply of gas to China to 85 from around 50 mm. by building so-called line B, D, which will move again through Central Asia, through Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan to China. So if it will be 85 billion cubic meters of Turkmenistan gas, China will face less risks of so-called political biasing. So that is why negotiations in Beijing these days are extremely important in terms of supplying new volumes of natural gas. But I want to underline one key important thing. It would be very good if China will, will be get from Turkmenistan not natural gas, but hydrogen. Hydrogen, which you can use everywhere. And hydrogen can be produced in Turkmenistan. So hydrogen supply, contrary to natural gas, will be much more value. And Turkmenistan has enough energy to transfer natural gas into hydrogen, much more sophisticated product. That is how these three, four gas pipelines can be used much more efficiently. Then Turkmenistan will receive more investments, high-tech investments of transferring of natural gas into hydrogen, yeah? Because pipeline already existing. So it's a huge potential of interaction. And again, Turkmenistan will have foreign direct investment from China in processing facility and electrolysis, for example. There's enormous potential uh, of interaction between two countries. Mm -hmm. So, Pavel, in that sense, you know, it's about energy security. I mean, it's importance uh, you know, for China. Uh, for example, China's reliance on uh, Turkmenistan for gas and uh, reliance on Russia for uh, oil, uh, crude oil from Russia, uh, because it's uh, friendly nations and so it's more secure compared to the uh, relying on sea lands, you know, um, uh, importing from uh, countries like the United States, given, of course, geopolitical risk nowadays. And the future, probably hydrogen uh, could be actually even to strengthen the competitiveness of the Chinese economy development. Oh, surely this is, of course, very important. Central Asia, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, became a, a source of different natural resources going to China. It's natural gas, it's oil, metals from the different Central Asian republics. And this is, of course, a mutual process because they are also buying a lot in China in, in exchange and uh, developing the uh, logistical corridors is important. A lot has been done. Uh, pipelines have been built, but more should be done, of course, in terms of investment and development in Central Asia, not just simply pumping natural resources out and uh, bringing consumer goods in. Uh, but developing logistics, uh, in, uh, uh, investing to use the local uh, 
human resources, and logistics, more logistics are important because for millennia, of course, Central Asia was an integral part of the uh, Silk Road. Uh, the logistical lines went from uh, east to west. Uh, then after in 19th century, after the Russian, uh, Russia went into Central Asia, uh, the modern logistical lines were built into Russia, mostly to Central Russia, Moscow, and from there, further on, say, to the West, and it's still very much that way uh, to a large extent. So uh, restoring the East-West connection, building, uh, say, uh, the corridor through the uh, Black, through the Caspian Sea and the Transcaucasia, uh, that's another alternative way, uh, will be very important for Central Asia uh, to survive and prosper in a uh, a world where there are serious problems. Say, well, one example, say, McDonald's, McDonald's has left Russia. And as a result, right now, it's announced that they're also uh, ending their operations in Kazakhstan. Not because they have any problems with Kazakhstan, but because the Kazakh, uh, the, uh, uh, McDonald's relied on uh, logistics and infrastructure that was built inside Russia for their bigger operation there. And so now they're unsustainable. So for these such things not to happen, if there's a continued standoff between Moscow and the West for Central Asia to continue to survive and prosper, they need absolutely connections to China more and connections with Chinese help build to the West and build to the West, Southwest, say the railroad project uh, that's that, that's essential for Central Asia and, of course, for China and to a large extent for Russia, because Russia does not want Central Asia to become a hotbed of uh, discontent and uh, if, the if the economy there collapses. Mm -hmm. uh, Wang Jin, uh, if you take a look at the discussions between the two presidents, uh, obviously, uh, according to the press briefing, uh, the latest had that, uh, you know, they talked about uh, the expansion of the uh, uh, energy cooperation, which includes, of course, the gas cooperation and also renewable energies. Uh, President Xi also talked about, uh, uh, you know, the encouraging more Chinese investment in Turkmenistan and also people-to-people -people exchange. So we are looking at uh, the deepening of cooperation between the two countries. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because uh, traditionally, if you look at the cooperation structure uh, between China on the one hand and also the Turkmenistan on the other hand, uh, the two countries majorly they focus upon the cooperation over the energy. For example, if you look at the data published in 2020, uh, I mean, the, the, the about um, more than uh, 5 billion U.S. dollars, uh, the, the bilateral trade concentrated on the energy sector. And meanwhile, a very few, not so much, but very few, about 500, uh, 500 uh, million U.S. dollars that focuses on the other sectors. So it means on the one hand, that traditionally we need energy sector is a very fun foundation for the two bilateral ties. This is very important. This is open. Okay, this is, good. This, is, this is a very good foundation. But on the other hand, we need to uh, expand it, as you say, to expand it, this cooperation area into other sectors, into the, for example, renew renewables energy sectors, for example, to the new infrastructure sectors, and means new uh, opportunities for the two sides. So under this new uh, international circumstances, so how to facilitate the understanding, the encourage the understandings between the two countries' people is very important because the understandings of different people different nations, different societies, they will become the very ba important backgrounds for the future opportunities of cooperation. So that is why we also, uh, the two presidents also agree to uh, to encourage the further people-to-people -people exchange. So I think in the future, we will face a very, very bright prospect for the bilateral ties uh, between China and the Turkmenistan. I think there will become will be a lot of more opportunities in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Autobayev, we know that, uh, you know, I think our audience probably, they are more familiar with the Belt and Road Initiative from China. And then uh, to Germanistan, they have this strategy called uh, Revitalizing the Silk Road. Tell us more about the uh, Turkmen uh, strategy and also how the two, you know, the, the BRI and Revitalizing the Silk Road strategy work together. Yes, uh, uh, definitely. I think that the president discussed also transport connectivity. 
So with events in Russia and Ukraine, more and more people, experts and logistical people thinking of uh, exploring so-called middle corridor. It means that the delivery of goods between China and Europe will move not through Russian and Belarusian territory, but through Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, via Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan, Turkey to Europe. So I know that Chinese suppliers don't have problems in shipping goods through Russian territory. However, European suppliers now reserved. Now they stopping supply of goods through Russian territory. So Turkmenistan, what I know, very interesting in bring in being being bridge between railroad connectivity between China and Europe, two superpowers of Eurasian continent. So now Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan investing a lot of resources to build infrastructure on Caspian Sea. So the goods will be shipped by uh, ships from Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan to Azerbaijan, further down to Turkey and Europe. So in that way, we all in Central Asia will be even more connected between China and Europe and to our friends in Azerbaijan and Turkey. In that respect, I read with very much interest of the article which uh, chairman of the Supreme Council of Turkmenistan, Berdi Muhammadov, wrote in CGTN website. He specifically mentioned that his country is willing to be logistic in logistic corridor and shipments of the goods by railway between China and Europe. It's not against anybody. It's just making their own infrastructure better. I want to underline one more thing. These days, almost half a billion of Chinese people have access to natural gas. Ten years ago, you had 170 million, three times increase. So further down, you need more gas, more natural gas. Experts calculated in 2035, China would need 610 billion cubic meters of gas, which is double of current volume. From where they can get it? There is not much choice. Only Turkmenistan can supply it. Let's be honest. With the discovery of recent Galkanish uh, gas field with a volume of 21 trillions of cubic meters of gas. This supply can move for dozens of centuries, dozens of decades. Mm -hmm. So is it clear synergy you know, about that? Right, the synergy. Uh, Mr. Autobayev, you know, I want you to continue to talk about, uh, you know, not only in Turkmenistan, but also Central Asia. If, for example, uh, President Xi mentioned about uh, five plus one, uh, this new format, uh, you know, between the five Central Asian nations and China uh, as a new platform. And China is to host the first summit of five plus one, uh, the six countries there. Uh, tell us some more, more about this new platform and uh, also uh, what can we expect uh, out of this uh, uh, realization of the uh, mechanism, uh, for example, the first summit? Yes, actually, uh, what's happening now, I am in my trip to ASEAN countries. I am currently in Singapore. I have been in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and Thailand. Because trade volume between China and ASEAN is number one in the world, exceeding trade volume of China between uh, United States and Europe. Incredible fact. How to bring this model of cooperation to Central Asia? That is my puzzle. We must do it. So we're bordering China from north and from the south. We have to learn from ASEAN on how to be efficient in mutual investments, building trust and building trade and building infrastructure. I was amazed by the uh, Kunming to Vientiane railway, which China built with Laos through the mountains. And China will build a similar railway from Kyrgyzstan to Uzbekistan further to the west. 
So we have clear synergy on how to learn from each other, how to capitalize on development of Chinese appetite to develop on infrastructure within Belt and Road Initiative. So we have to learn what ASEAN doing well and what Central Asia is not yet doing well. Mm-hmm. Huh? Well, and this, this is uh, clear synergy of our cooperation. Right. Uh, th- this is very important. This region, uh, you know, even uh, from a different perspective, Pavel, uh, we have noticed that, uh, for example, several European Union officials visited uh, uh, this region, uh, obviously with an eye set on, uh, like, with with the side on on the Ukraine crisis. Uh, you know, they are looking at uh, probably. Uh, you know, Russia's interests in mind, you know, whether this is uh, uh, Russia's presence in this region, they want to strengthen their relationship with this region, probably, uh, you know, connected with the role of Russia in this region too. What do you make of that? Well, it has been um, a kind of a long-term Western policy to uh, find ways to kind of... uh, develop relations with Central Asia in a way that it will lessen uh, their those nations' uh, rely, reliance on Russia and maybe to some extent on China. On the other hand of it, of course, it's also important for the West and for Europeans to help maintain uh, social and political stability in Central Asia. And so uh, that policy was always a sort of subtile because uh, provo- uh, prom- uh, provoking any kind of conflicts in Central Asia is uh, detrimental to everyone, the West included. And as a, a year ago in January uh, 22, there was this uh, destabilization in Kazakhstan, which demonstrated how easily the situation and the security situation in Central Asia can go from a a kind of relative stability to total instability. And it was Russia with that uh, swiftly intervened and uh, helped keep the situation in Kazakhstan and in Central Asia in general stable, because if one Central Asian nation falls to instability, uh, it could uh, have a domino effect on others. Uh, Right now, most likely, if what happened a year ago happened now, it would be, well, not so easy for Russia to intervene because, well, the same actual airborne units that were moved in and swiftly helped stabilize without much bloodshed at all. Uh, the situation in Kazakhstan are right now engaged in Ukraine. Uh, so there should be uh, alternative ways to keep the stability. And I believe that's in everybody's interest. European Union is going to be looking into Central Asia, but I don't think that they want to kind of, well, uh, diminish Russia's role uh, uh, on, with the price tag being destabilization. So stabilization, that's what Russia wants, that's what uh, China wants, that's what the locals want, and that's what the West want. And we sh- it's better to keep an understanding that Central Asia is a place, dangerous place, and we should handle it with care. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing briefly, uh, so we can basically draw the conclusion. I mean, stability, development, uh, uh, they are the uh, commonality, you know, for Central Asia and also for Russia, European Union, China, probably the U.S. included here. Yes, I think the stability and the development is, are the very complementary. Uh, uh, without stability, there were no development. Without development, there were <laughs> solid. Uh, stability. So in the future, how can the international society, including China and Russia and other parts, could get involved together to uh, cooperate closely with the situation countries will be the very, very shared mm-hmm. uh, their desires for the related countries. So I think in the future, we will witness more bright prospect in, uh, between China and yes. Central Asian corporations. Right. Uh, thank you. On that note, we concluded today's show. Uh, again, many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.